flavor saver facial hair with desert eagles, you know, and sideburns and double wielding pistols. Um, as we were calling it uh, earlier, uh, very, very Quentin Totino's, we were calling it. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> <laughs> all oh, right everybody right. <laughs> it's time for one fucking hour i am evan husney joined of course by my huge co-hosts we got uh tom fitzgerald here to my left hi 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 and uh on hot on the acoustics uh here we got to my right uh <laughs> i'm very happy to be here <laughs> oh Mar- oh marcus herring uh how's it going marcus you're looking good hey guys that song may or may not make more sense by the end of the episode. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, well, thanks, everybody, for checking out last week's uh, TASM. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, if you're uh, watching us now on YouTube or listening to us on Spotify, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're doing this once a week. Uh, it will be a new episode every week. And this week, this fucking hour, we are getting into our first documentary. And that is the uh, two, from 2003, our first foray into the 2000s, uh, with the film Overnight, chronicling the, um, I guess, ill-fated uh, making of the Boondock Saints, and featuring, of course, its director, Troy Duffy. And guys, I'm going to start that clock. So right, let's do it. Here we go. Boom. Dairy down. Dairy down. So right out of the gate... Um, I sort of feel like this might be our most deep cut film that we've picked thus far, arguably. And um, I guess we should just give a little primer for those of you know who've ne- who've not seen it and are going to stick with us for this hour, right, Tom? Yeah, I, I, you know, honestly, we're going to assume that uh, no one watching tonight uh, now um, has even heard of this film uh, at all, necessarily, much less seen it, uh, which is a little counterintuitive. It's going against the grain a bit for sort of the mission statement of one fucking hour. Right. Uh, we were kind of thinking that we maybe tackle films that are pretty well known, but we do put our, you know, take on it. Right. But this is, a, you're right, a very deep cut for us and in general. I guess is all I'm trying to say. Uh, Boondock Saints is very famous uh, and and kind of infamous. But um, yeah, this is. I stumbled on it. I had no idea. I've never heard of it. Uh, it was an IFC regular, like IFC channel, like mid two thousands. Like it was on every other day, and I was just like. And I watched it every time. I just couldn't, I could not stop watching. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, that's how I found out about it. I stumbled on it. Yeah, so. In a nutshell. And of course, you new guys knew about it. (laughs) Like, you know. Well, yeah, in a nutshell, it's the, it's the, uh, it's one of the best behind the scenes, one of the best making of movies. One, uh, definitely from the 2000s. It's one of those great movies about making movies, right? So mm-hmm. uh, totally. this is the story of the making of a film that I've never seen, but yeah. I've seen the making of several times. So I've never <laughs> seen Boondock Saints. That's cool. I like that. But, uh, this is the story of how they made it. And I've I, seen BS. Let's that's, let's leave it at that. Oh, yeah. A couple You've times. You've seen BS. Wow. Well, I was so curious because I'm such a, a – well, you know, a, a, we call it a overalls around here. <laughs> which we can get into later, but over um, uh, overnight, uh, you know, I was so curious. I was like, well, it was not, not it wasn't like, is it going to be good? Maybe it was like the degrees, like the scale, like how bad are we talking here? And it was even worse than I expected. But well, that's, you saw it when it, you saw it when it, no, no, wait, overnight, not years like after it. seeing overnight. Right. It was, I was, I was kicking like, around the video store. When I worked at a video store, it was like hot off the presses you know, and I, I, I didn't realize that it was that it didn't, you know, really have a, a huge general release or anything that it was just, uh, you know, basically almost like a straight to video movie because it was such a it occupied a large space on the shelf it at did. our video store. Well, I had, I had to, heard of it. I, I, I had to endure fucking high school uh, when this movie came out. So you can only wow. imagine what that would have been like. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> let's let's uh, let's get right into it here. I think the best way to set up what overnight is. Um, and of course, uh, the directors of the film, uh, Tony Montana uh, and Mark <laughs> Brian Smith, uh, directed this uh, documentary from 2003. Uh, I think the best way to kind of you know catch everybody up to speed is to actually show 
uh, the cold open of the documentary itself, which kind of sets right. up Boondock Saints, Troy Duffy, and everything that was going on at the time. So I think we're just going to shoot right over to that if you guys cool, don't mind. Good idea. Great. Yeah. So here we go. And this is the beginning to Overnight. It's classic story overnight of the Hollywood Kramer. dream coming true from bartender to movie maker overnight with a bar thrown in as a bonus. Patrick Healy is live in West Hollywood with the tale. Jess, we've all heard the legend of actress Lana Turner being discovered in a soda fountain. So what's wrong with a saloon being remembered as the launching pad for Hollywood's newest wonder kid? If Very you don't recognize the unshaven guy in the shades, or if you've never heard the name Troy Duffy, don't feel left out. But that's changing real fast. <laughs> On the front page Ooh. of the Hollywood Reporter is Filmland's I newest shook up the find. World, Ma. Only this Cinderella is a tough guy bartender and bouncer from Boston whose very first script just got him a near million dollar deal with Miramax Films, the outfit that just cleaned up on Oscar night. I never thought for a second that it would happen so quickly. His script, The Boondock Saints, is about a couple of Boston brothers who take it on themselves to eliminate evil. Pulp Fiction with Soul is the best analogy one of the producers could come up with. Duffy wrote the script during breaks from Tending Bar here at Jay Sloan's, a Melrose saloon no one would ever confuse with Morton's or the other places the Hollywood high rollers usually hang out at. But Miramax president Harvey Weinstein came here to make the deal with Duffy. I felt from that, from that offer, that, uh, he was more passionate. Not only that, he agreed to buy Duffy the bar, and Duffy bought the deal. So Duffy and his entourage have to go back to Boston next week to scout locations, but for now, well, they're hanging out at Jay Sloan's. <laughs> Reporting live from West Hollywood, Patrick Kelly, Charles let the corruption let the corruption begin. <laughs> so th Pulp that should answer with, uh, Pulp Fiction with soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not even close. <laughs> Uh, it's like I think it. I, God, I always forget the name of the movie. It's more like a, a, a shit version of the of the of the Hit List, which is that Marky Mark film by that Hong Kong director, which I've also kind of like seen. A John Woo type thing, right? Not not even John Woo. It's like it's all like several layers down, and it's like what people think is campy Tarantino esque dialogue. You know, like breaking oh. up with your girlfriend during a shootout, or whatever. It's yeah. like much. It's, everything's many levels down. Yeah. And, and it has like, you know, it's kind of has a look of like Charlie's Angels reboot, you know, 2000s one ish, you know, like but going, going to Canada, you know, like, like house music's going. And this he's what going I call... for kind of like a Pulp Fiction, Two Days in the Valley type. Oh, well, that's what Miramax is going for, right? Yeah, but it's going. not. It's it's totally it's much more Charlie's Angels. So. <laughs> well, it's what I've been calling Mountain Dew John Woo. That's what I've been calling this genre. <laughs> <laughs> I have nice. I. I have a bunch of these. Uh, Man bites corn dog. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So. This is not going to be the most serious uh, one fucking hour. Let's, <laughs> no. just, put it, let's just put it that right. way. Okay. Lighthearted. Okay. But uh, we, it might take some serious turns. But, you know, uh, maybe I have some preliminary questions. I, again, I hope that answers all the, the basic questions of this, of this film, you know. But uh, maybe Evan or just both you guys. Like, I have some thoughts. Let me just articulate very quickly, like what I think happened here. Sure. Number one, Harvey Weinstein, you guys might have heard of. He is um, uh, overnights or overalls. Um, he's the nemesis. He's the bad guy. He's the uh, antagonist. Right. And um, and now, from what I understand, so he, he he. I thought about this today. It's like who was very very hot for Tarant for sorry Weinstein and company. Uh, it was Tarantino, of course, but it was very much so right then in '97 um, to sort of they seemed like brothers and they were from boston right kind of like salty tough guy but they wrote like this really great script yo it's like goodwill hunting you know what i mean so well, it feels like please oh yeah let me let me just tag in there because uh i think you know well first off pulp fiction was soul you know like that's already right in the beginning of <laughs> right in the beginning of overalls they're immediately setting that cynical tone which i think is going to run through mean. the whole thing i know yeah. But the thing is, is that this the time in which this movie really, you know, fires off. It's right in the pocket there in that late '90s, you know, and and the '90s was a a decade where, you know, <coughs> you know, films like Pulp Fiction and Tarantino, you know, they made directors, filmmakers, rock stars, just like how yeah. stand-up comedians, you know, were in the '80s during the stand-up yeah. boom. Kevin the same Smith. sort of thing. 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. So they're all rock stars. It was like well, 95 or 96, that was like the year of the indie movie at the Oscars. It was like the year of the indie yeah. movie and like English Patient, all these all these indie movies, quote unquote, right. like swept the Oscars, right? So it was a big hot deal. Right. And so what we saw out of that opening is you 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 see the narrative, the the you know, the press getting ahead of the story, everyone getting ahead of the story. Sure. This very like amazing, you know, Hollywood tale of where Harvey Weinstein is basically trying to replicate the origin story of Quentin Tarantino, bringing a guy sort of you know even though he made reservoir dogs but he's ostensibly coming from a video right. store blue collar job and he's making these good headlines and we're gonna make this kid's dreams come true people love that and um yeah. but of course you know that's all well and good gonna buy him the bar it makes great headlines but as we see this turns into descends into a nightmare pretty quick yeah and um w- one last thing on that too so you have that going on uh in the cultural zeitgeist but also right in the pocket you we have that brew like 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 that brewing uh white male macho new metal aggression you know you know woodstock fred, very fred durst times oh yeah wouldn't woodstock 99 shit so that's firing off and you know it, this is a confluence yeah. of both of those things happening at the same time shameless uh toxic masculinity you know exactly Proud. Um, yeah, no, right. but if, if I might just plead this ca- beat this dead horse just a little bit, I think that, it, you know, Tarantino, of course, was the, the top of the mountain, but it, it was it was it was evolving. And I, I remember this. I lived through this. And it was um, really the Wonderkins were Matt Damon and uh, Ben Affleck. And that's honestly, I feel that's more the Cinderella story that Weinstein brain trust and, and mm. you know, corporate uh, Hollywood media was going for because. You know, Tarantino was a nerd, a film nerd, video store clerk, and that's a great thing. But what you have here, and I think there's some suspicion about it, those two guys wrote Goodwill Hunting. And again, there is some suspicion that like their writing teacher kind of wrote a third or half or most of it or something. Oh, you yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So um, that was Bostonians. actually the hottest. They're Bostonians. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's like, hey, I got a brain too over here. You know, like, and, and that's what he wanted to play up. It's almost like a Rocky thing from the 70s. More, because Tarantino makes sense. Like, film, film nerd makes film nerd movies. You know, and it's, I mean, that's a huge deal. That's where it got started. But I think this was a very cynical move on the part of Weinstein. And I have a theory, and I just want to run it by you guys, that like, you know, it was all, I don't know if he ever intended to make Boondock Saints, as he never intended to really buy the bar. He's, you know, he's a, he, he does... Right. He's shrewd. He's he's a smart guy, you know. He's evil, but he's a smart guy, and he, and he, and there's a reason he's success, successful, not just that he's a bully or something like that, but he's knows how to like play the media and play pop culture. So I feel that he never was in, was even going to make Boondock Saints because he probably looked. Uh, he sized up Duffy up and down the oh, second yeah. he met him. Was like I was like, no, this is, I'm not really going to do this. And by the way, I did read that book. Uh, God damn it. Peter Bart, uh, his follow up to Raging. Bo- yeah, thank you. So I read that and there's like three or four stories of of uh, Weinstein destroying careers like you're so great. The guy did Copland. OK, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. remember that part of the book? And like so. So he brings him in. The guy made an interesting independent film. Totally forgot what it's called. But um, then he's like, come here, let's make Copland. Let's get, you know, I, I, I got De Niro on, you know, uh, speakerphone like right now. Let, let's let's do it. Let's make the greatest movie since, you know, Goodfellas. And he destroyed uh, uh, Copland and he destroyed the director's career. And there's a bunch of other examples. So I feel like if he even made um, uh, Boondock Saints, uh, you know, he would have yeah. it would have gone through the mill and maybe yeah. even not come out or, you know, something like that. Maybe was, uh, I, I like to think. But I don't that even he know if he would have made it. Yeah. I, know, I, I just, like, just wanted the story. I like the idea that he was going to make it because it, it changes the whole meaning of the movie if he wasn't, you know, because it's like it's really the story of this guy blowing his big chance by being an asshole right so i don't if he know he never had a chance I, I think, in the first place then i guess uh i don't i don't think he did i think he was it was like 50 50 at best because i don't think he's blowing it yeah i think he's getting a big slap in the face lesson of how hollywood works lesson number one bend over and shut up you know and like keep smiling um <laughs> and so he didn't do that but i think he also was just sort of uh shadow boxing if i can be pretentious like Duffy, it's just like, I don't really think it was that real of a deal that Tarantino made because it, he just wanted a cheap headline. Yeah. And uh, Feel good I don't story. think he was that serious. It's yeah. even hard to imagine the circumstances under which it all would have happened. You know, it's like, it seemed like the bar was kind of popping off as like a place where people would go to kind of hang out, <laughs> like maybe even agents and like actors and stuff might even go to chill. 
And uh, it's hard to imagine like that Harvey was in there. Someone must have shep- got that script and like shepherded of course, it to of him, course. right? So. Can I, my, I'll shut up about this, but my, my one exhibit A about how it was maybe 50-50 at the most that uh, Harvey would have made Boondock, the script sucks. It's not good. Like, oh, yeah. Like, it, the script's just not good, like, like on paper. Right. Like, he's not stupid, and he probably looked at the script and went like, where's the script? Like, what is this? You know, it's, it's idiotic. He wouldn't have re- he wouldn't have been that excited. It's just publicity. It's just a publicity right. stunt. Isn't totally. like kind of a 50-50 game for every film almost? You know, it just no, takes I mean, long it, to get everything's different. This is a very specific example. That script is not good, and Harvey did have good good radar, good taste on things. I'm and he's sorry. got a, you know, like, and he's got a was lo- terrible script. He's very, very PR savvy, and there's a lot of folks, especially. Yeah, just a real quick shout out to uh, Down and Dirty Pictures. It's an incredible read. It's it's just it, yeah. exhilarating. The history of Miramax and all the, uh, you know, actually Boone I say not mentioned at all in the book, and I'm not surprised. That's but, right. Yeah, That's right. <clears throat> not not mentioned at all. So that that tells you right yeah. there. Uh, but anyway, so no, exactly. Uh, it wasn't even taken that seriously yeah. enough for the biographer to to make it a, a chapter. So Good point. Uh, yeah. So, but one thing I want to talk Jeez. about quick because what's uh. What's, you know, the main takeaway from this film, uh, Overnight, now we're talking about Overnight, is, you know, the, 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 the idea of Mr. Troy Duffy, the director of Boondock Saints. You know, he has this attitude, this corrosive attitude in the film where he sort of, fe- even though he's been plucked out of thin air, set up, uh, you know, set up uh, dreams coming true on track for not only just Boondock Saints to happen, but also his band, The Brood, this, you know, alternative rock nightmare to also get signed. Um, like a, a C-list uh, Alice in Chains, yeah, sort of. Right. Totally. Yeah, like it's hopelessly uncool even in like 97. You know, like it wasn't yeah. tracking with any trend. They're not I like know. a... 97's like a, like Sublime and stuff. You know, they're not like a I know. ska band or anything. God, not like I know. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's not even grunge, really. It's sort of like no. blues rock. You it's know? like the cult in like and 87 or something. It's not like or Proto something. White Stripes. <laughs> it's not even like... Yeah. A, yeah. It's just like, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But yeah. so... So, so cult, sorry. Yeah. So Duffy has this attitude throughout the whole film that, you know, Hollywood owes him everything and they should and everyone in Hollywood, including Harvey Weinstein, should be grateful that they intersected with my path. You know, that's kind of his attitude throughout the whole thing. Absolutely. And what's really interesting and we should go to a clip right now. But before we do, it's yeah. like, you know, one thing that's really great about this movie and and and, and similar Holly, what makes it separate separates it from similar tales of Hollywood is that it's not a story about a director who's corrupted by money and fame, <laughs> you know, or, or even of that. It's like, it's basically just holding up that black light, you know, in the motel room to something that's yeah. already there, you know, revealing this dark, disturbing side about this person and his character, you know, that's already yeah. deep seated in him as a person. Isn't that what they say about fame or power or both is that, you know, it's an, uh, God, what is it? An MRI of the soul. Mm-hmm, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's just like you, yeah. you and everyone else are going to find out who you really are. And yeah, this exactly. guy is a miserable sociopathic douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up and down. Ends with a quote. I forget who it's by, but it ends with a quote saying mm-hmm. that like that fame doesn't change anybody. It just reveals who you right. really are were exactly. all along. Yeah. Which is spot on let's, to this. Because this is the heart of the film. Uh, <laughs> it's a portrait of this doucher. Because so let's if, look at. Yeah. Oh, right. If it did change anybody, this would be the smallest amount of power that ever went to someone's head. <laughs> you know? I know. Well, it's projected fakey publicity uh, machine powder. Power. Right. That's, right. The, that's the thing. He's like, he's such a fool. He's so stupid <laughs> that um, he's, he's thinking that all this, that bullshit Hollywood talk that even dorks like us know about. You know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. dusted by in right it's just like you got to take that like with no grain of salt you know it's just like okay cool let's do lunch you know and he's just totally buying all of it you know sincerely <laughs> because totally. he's a megalomaniac and he's, he has an ego problem and um you know he's uh he's power tripping immediately by just one person uh that he recognizes from a movie you know like uh kissing his ass unbelievable let's get to the clip okay here's he's a, a monster he, here's a scene <laughs> Here's a scene I hope he's from. Watching. Here's a here's a scene. <laughs> Jesus Christ! He's heard all this before. <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay. Here's a scene from the film. It's uh, at breakfast with Troy Duffy. Here he is at breakfast with the family, uh, and this is really where it kind of sows the seeds of this this personality that we're about to follow in this film. Yeah. So here we go. More than a year, thousands and thousands of people are gonna know about what's going on. I can't wait. People think we're fuck ups. Everybody thinks we're fuck-ups, except the right people. 
The right people see everything because they see the talent there. They see the material. That's his they dad. see the way we are. See how unintimidated we are by every everyone. You know, you've been there sometimes with me in meetings with some of the biggest guys in this town, Tony. I sit down there. I got drunk the night before. I'm hungover as hell. I'm wearing my overalls. These guys are all in suits. I look like a mess. I'm smoking. Yeah. Can I have a cigarette? This says you know, everything. That says everything. Heard, oh, yeah. I've had this happen to my friends. It always falls through. Be prepared to get your ass kicked. And I still get what I need done. Your friends descend upon you like a bunch of fucking vultures. Question, what's going on with this? You tell them and they go, never work out. Never. <laughs> Fuck you. I heard you did a fucking uh, a Channel 4 interview in the bar today. You're going to be on the news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to be on in five minutes. Here we go. Bam, they see me. It's, it's going to fall through. What do I got to do to you fucking people? If our music in this film is embraced, we will have accomplished something that no one else in the history of this fucking world has ever done. Unreal. Be accepted on a huge scale in both mediums of film and music. If we accomplish that... Big baller. Wow. You can't you can't write that. Big baller. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you can't write that. (laughs) Sorry. I was thinking about the whole time in this movie was I was wondering if uh if if Troy Duffy's character was an influence on Danny McBride and his and his character. Oh god. It's so eastbound and down. I looked it up and I was like, what year was Foot Fist Way? It's two thousand six. And I was like, I think I just busted Danny McBride. I think he watched this movie, thought this guy was fucking hilarious. Huh. You know, if he hasn't, he'd love to see it. Because <laughs> the you know, are he, directly out of his mouth. Like, everyone's trying no, to that, lick my nuts. No, know? totally. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone wants a piece of my shit. Okay. You know? okay. No, I know. I know. It's so true. I mean, he's doing John Rocker, the actual baseball player. Yeah. But mm. there could be a little Duffy uh, in but there. I think, he might have seen this, but he might yeah. not have because it's so fucking obscure. Although so, those guys dig deep, him and Green and everything. David Gordon Green. Yeah. So I'm just going to say one thing about this too, like that really hit me here when I'm watching it again last night. It's, um, you know, the three of us have encountered people, I'm sure, in our lives who've had dreams and illusions and disillusions of making movies and, uh, you know, and stardom, achieving stardom. And anytime that I kind of cross paths with that, I always just imagine like, dude, no, you just got to turn the camera around and focus it on yourself because that's yeah. really the story. And that's what's fucking right. awesome about Overnight is that it is that. Yeah. It is finally someone saw that about this you know, crazy delusional person in their in their life, and uh, and, and and really documented it, and and that's what's amazing. And that's one thing I always. Here's a question for you guys, okay? Yeah. At what point do you think Tony Montana and his directing partner? Um, at what point? Guys, do you shooting think, everything. Yeah. Like they're and he's and they're buds with him. Like well, he's buds. Bu- here's my question: right. At what point did it flip? Right. Where they started, they're all yeah. friends, and then they're like, "Whoa, we're this is special." What are I we? Know. I this. Yeah, I wonder the same. I had the same I think, question. Yeah. No, go please. ahead, Tom. Well, it's just I think there's. Uh, I'm not sure I was asking quite the same question. It's like, when do they turn on him? Is what I'm thinking. Yeah. And yeah. say, oh, yeah, let's just like you know turn the heat on him and make this hit piece film. Um, I think it's the way he treated the band, honestly. And by the way, we're not even getting into that yet. There are two separate huge doucher you know um like unique circumstances here there's hollywood but there's this huge thing with the band and record labels but i think since they're all a tight-knit group the 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 videographer documentarians duffy and then the band duffy's band the brood um i think that the way he treats them is so foul and you see it in overnight um that i think that's when they turn because they don't care about what happens in hollywood and everything like that but that's like friends like high school buddies kind of thing and the way he treats them and the way duffy treats his own brother who's in the band oh awful. is is, is yeah. it's really obscene and it's just like the only thing that I, you know makes me not care that much is the way he treats them is um they take it and i'm like fuck you guys why, why don't you why doesn't anybody ever stand up to this guy you know right they're all just kind of lazing out like like lying down on the couch just staring at him the whole movie is like kind of cut like a, like a duffy soliloquy you know everyone is just silent like listening to him you know well um i think, I think they're like, all they're all abused by him you know i think they're all like yeah. totally abused by him totally 
and don't know how to deal with it. And he's very overbearing totally. and he's very difficult. And he's the guy that's unfortunately their their ticket making, you know making shit happen. Yeah. Making yeah. shit happen. Yeah. He's holding it all together. I, yeah. I think that they were I feel like they were earnestly trying to do their job as the the filmmakers were earnestly trying to do their job as like the band management, right? Because isn't that their yeah. other gig? Is that they're yeah. like the managers yeah. for the band? So right. I think they were trying to, and they were sticking with it, thinking like this band's about to take off. And I'm going to get paid. And unfortunately, they're like, I can't like, uh, I can't pay my rent. My my girlfriend's buying me lunch or whatever. The guy's complaining he doesn't have any money at all. I think they were holding out for that payday, and I think they had faith in him and the project up until that yeah. point. And I think and I do think it's a posthumous kind of like, all right. Going through the footage and be like, "Fuck this guy, let's eviscerate him." And they just cut yeah. the shit. This is a total hit piece. It's incredible. It's one of the best hit pieces ever. Yeah, but yeah. it's so edited down. Well, he like, gives him so much ammo. Ammo. Oh God, yeah. he gives him so much ammo. There's probably shit on the cutting room floor. You know, it's even more mind blowing. I saw a hilarious clip, or like I just read a, a little blurb where he's like, "Well, it's it's cut so unfairly to make me look like an asshole." But I mean, like, God. you mean those long takes <laughs> that never cut away from him going on for like eight minutes? Like, well, you know, berating uh, the band. No, but Evan, you, you, you really helped me kind of um, see it from a great angle. Uh, and maybe we should play this scene next because we're really talking about this situation of um, the mistreatment of, you know, people close to him and the band members. But uh, cult leader, you know, uh, you know, I got into cults through uh, cult film documentaries years ago, and he's using tactics, probably unknowingly, but he's using classic tactics and um, he's pushing all their buttons. He knows each of them so well. And um, and he's uh, and he's abusive. Uh, he basically just knows how to like play them, and uh, he's doing things right out of the cult mem- cult leader playbook. Uh, and this scene is 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 not even funny. Let's check it out. How well, he this is the, the scene, and, and and this is the scene where let's just let's just for context, they yeah. uh, allegedly had a deal with Maverick, you know Madonna's uh, record label. And this is is this at the point where they're they've pulled out now? Is that what it is? Right. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, Maverick will not let Duffy in the building. Okay. Maverick okay. building. Duffy tried. Duffy's. This is Duffy get, coming back to them and saying, um, Maverick wouldn't uh, let me in. Like the okay, lobby okay. wouldn't even let me in to, to talk okay. to anybody. Okay, let's do it. Maverick the deal's done. Scare me on this. As a matter of fact, we are scaring them shitless right now. They're the ones having little emergency meetings and not letting me in the front door of Maverick. They're the ones calling up our lawyers feverishly trying to schedule something with me. They're on the fucking run right now, not us. Because they know that we're going to be successful. And they know that on that day that we are successful, they're going to say, well, we heard you had a fucking record deal with Maverick Records. We're going to say, yeah. They backed out and got cold feet the last second. And that's what these motherfuckers are more afraid of than anything in the entire world. The four most important people in this equation right now are me and the rest of the members of the band. Everybody else comes second. Hat. And you pay Take these the guys and anything, group. you get it for Great them. Cult. You don't ask them questions. Don't matter what you're doing. You get it for them. You keep your mouth fucking shut. As far as I'm concerned, failure is not an option anymore. Anybody fail? <laughs> Hold on, sorry. Keep your mouth fucking shut is no, so crazy. About, about what? To oh, who? Yeah. Okay. I love, like, uh, like yeah. don't yeah. talk about the band to anyone. Okay. The first That's rule the of thing too, he's like yeah. everyone else. The band, the four guys here, are the most important thing. Everybody else in this room comes second. You know, okay. That's, a, that's oh, amazing that's, line. <laughs> there's, there's more. Let's finish. It. I know. Here there's we go. More. Here we go. Sorry, I had to, I had to cut him off. They're gone. Gone. They're fired. They're out of our lives. And it'll be your fault at the end of the fucking day. It'll be your fault that you fucked up this bet. God. Will you keep us more involved then? No. You've been doing a lot of this shit by yourself. No, I won't. Because I deserve to be exactly where I am here. Remember the last time I kept you involved and you all of a sudden turned to Donald Trump telling me and everybody else about how how to arrange this record deal? That's not going to happen anymore. No more fuck-ups. I'll keep you informed. Okay. But the big band-aid is success at the end of the fucking day. And that's all that fucking matters here. You have to keep your mouth shut and do your fucking jobs. You have to. Get it. <laughs> so yeah, that's just like, that's, that's that's just like there's so much there. That's um that is a very sick father children uh dynamic 
Yeah. Like, and, and, and a really fucked up father, you know, like, um, it's your fault. Like, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you were abused. It's your fault. It's just like, what the fuck, man? And the thing is, he has willing participants. They're doing the dance. I mean, you know, any normal person would just go, this guy sucks. I'm going home. You know what I mean? Like, I think like, it's when you're, when you're caught up in the spell though. I think that is part of the yeah. cult thing. Cause you are kind of cult. You're, 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 you, 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 you've been it with it. You're in a band with these guys. They're probably struggling. They have no, they're just bar loser guys. They don't really have yeah. much. Anything and to, else. And, and then to kind of dangle the Hollywood thing. And, and especially there is a scene shortly before the scene where, you know, Troy tells him, hey, we got the deal at Maverick. And these guys, I mean, so, you know, it, it know. is kind of, it's, I mean, I think when we watch it, we're like, why doesn't someone just punch this guy in the face? I think it's more complicated than that because they are just it so, is. you know. But I think there's a few things. I think there's the uh, the dangling of fame and fortune generally and by Duffy, you know, because uh, he knows that'll, you know, uh, the breadcrumbs will keep them moving forward in his direction. But I do think there's also a sick dynamic because, Real dudes or real anybody, real human beings would push back, but not like, fuck you, I'm leaving, I'm quitting the band, but more like, man, listen to yourself. You were totally full of shit. Like, people would call him out for the greater good of getting somewhere. But I well, think his, they're just weak. Uh, they're weak beta people, kind of. You know well, what I mean? Well, he's sort of surrounded himself with people, like you yes. said, cult. Marcus cult nailed it. Uh, yeah. he, he likes, he's, he, he's one of those people, really sick people, who sizes up people and goes, oh, they're weak. And they just they just tolerated this. Right. They'll tolerate because they are pretty geeky too, like Gordon, you know, or whatever. Like they're they don't they're not like cool Jimmy, looking band Jimmy. guys. I love yeah. Jimmy. They they look so out of place. Girls. They look like like late nineties kind of like or late eighties kind of like you know long hair goatee. They don't seem like I know. They look like Nickelback happening. actually. They're not happening cool dudes, you know. I don't they look know. like Nickelback. Yeah, they look like we're yeah. huge. Nickelback looks a little cooler, actually. These guys are just like so schlubby. You know, <laughs> you know what? By a degree, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I, agree. <laughs> I love right, this. Take a look at Mar- take a look at Maroon Five, not the lead singer. No, it's another kind of. <laughs> I, I love this discourse. Fest. Okay, let's let's uh, let's uh, let's um, whatever. I, I know personally about them. <clears throat> Give me fuel. Give me financing. All right. Sorry. Uh, By the way, right, this is the fastest clock we've ever had. I know. It's insane. We're halfway let's, done. I know. We're halfway done. Let's. We have a lot Go to ahead. get through. Let's. Uh, now that we're on the thread with the band, let's just get to Skunk Baxter mm. from the Doobie Brothers uh, being blown the fuck Doobie. away by uh, the brood here. Um, yeah. Let him tell tell it. All right. He was going to produce them. Yeah. He did. He did, yeah. He's yeah. No he sound, did. No sound. Oh, sorry. No sound. No shirt. No oh, shirt. Overall, overall, <laughs> overall back, man. Overall back. Overall, we're overall shirtless. That's the major move. Oh, we got sound. I was really impressed with the vocals. Sort of, if the Beatles could uh, could meet Alice in Chains, you know, and somehow come come up with a vocal style that was that lush, but still had the power. I was really really impressed. (laughs) So I think there's something about this band that would enhance the music business. Well, actually, that's kind of interesting. Like really quick like that, or just leaving out that last chord? Ooh. No, I play play that. The seventh chords hurt my soul. They still have to learn a little bit about the craft. (laughs) So. (laughs) Yeah, he's being tactful. I guess, is that him just like trying to like keep this payday? Of getting this yeah. publishing gig, like he was doing he, like I, PSA. I, I remember him doing like PSAs and stuff around this time. Skunk back, yeah. And I, he also yeah. had like he was like a government spook. He was doing like contract work for like the Navy. Yeah, you he's know, freaky. like as like an audio what? guy. He was like nuclear scientist. <clears throat> something weird, what? like he really? was, like, a weird second That's job. Cool. Yeah, because I just I don't believe him. Uh, no, you know, I just I, I don't believe Beatles. When you say Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> that's such an empty comparison because it's like they're kind of like some shitty '90s band and like the greatest uh, musical act ever. You know what I mean? It's the hype. <laughs> it's too hyperbolic. You know, it's it's like it could it should have been more like they've got like the shuffle of like Aerosmith and kind of you know what I mean? It's like it's a little more more of a grounded comparison. They got the like, roar of Beatles. Yeah, Pearl Jam. <laughs> it's like Sergeant Pepper and you know uh, Alice in Chains. It's like uh, <laughs> really so. So let's anyway. let's uh, let's close the loop on the band and then come back to the film. Yeah, to the so, brood. Yeah, Wait, hold on. The, it's the brood. Then they changed their name because of the movie to Boondock Saints. That's one of the questions I have. 
Yeah, I missed that. That's true. Was the yeah, brood... they were the brood, and then after the movie came out, they decided that, and they did the soundtrack. They decided to change the name to the Boondock Saints, which <sighs> was probably their best move. You know, to be honest. Like, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. And to another uh, movie title. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. An- another one fucking hour uh, p- potential oh, episode. Brood's coming up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, all right. Let's 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 quickly just look at the close the loop on the band here. And this is some of the best shit in the movie, period, is um, really when the album finally comes out, they've endured all oh. the bullshit from Troy Duffy. Let's just talk over it right. because we can. Um, we can. So this is, um, they all hate him right now, and they're probably all not talking, and it's the saddest, lamest photo shoot ever. <laughs> Looking good, guys. Oh, my I God. I know, it's so, This, by the way, this is like 2000. And they look like this. They've got these sort of like uh, matrix coats and Oakley glasses, and it's then the like bowler uh, hats. Wait, wait, wait. Bowler hats. <laughs> wait, it's the it's and, the turtle and the hounds. You know, wait, wait. Sorry, God damn it! I love this. The album's called. Um, wait, wait. It's it, it, it it's the turtleneck mafia. Okay, pa- just, oh pause it. Turtle just pause neck. it. Just pause it. Just pause it. Just pause it. Just pause it. So first of all, my favorite thing is they're posing with uh, dogs because the album's called. Release the hounds, you know. So that's in, that's important. <laughs> and then also they have that thing. I hate bands who kind of don't get their look together, or or the, oh, you're running it. Okay, well, whatever. Like two are long hairs and two are like short hairs. So this is the album being manufactured. The album no one wants. That's never going to go into any homes. I love that's that they went and shot all this. Like, Hold the guys on, making the docs went and shot all this. No, stuff. totally. And then a sad morning at like Tower Records. Sam Goody. Uh, Okay, I guess I'm putting up a couple dozen, and it's like, get ready to do the exact same thing backwards in two weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, sorry, can you pause it, actually? Let's go slower. Let's go slower. Can you pause it? So now the band has, um, the band just released the album. It's probably obligatory. They were on, a, like, an Atlantic record subsidiary, and, they, you know, there was so much acrimony between the, the rest of the, the Goofus band and, and, and Duffy that this is around like 2000 the album comes out they don't even probably care about the album you know what i mean it's just it's all over so what we get here oh so the album sales take a while marcus do you know you know right i do yeah i do know i know okay it's, uh, 690 yeah. right 690 that's not good <laughs> if if i'm not mistaken not it's thousand not, 690 no right? <laughs> three digits six nine oh <laughs> so what oh, so no. what happens is this is like maybe getting into like 2001 ish um, there's a great thing at the end of the documentary. They check in with the band, the Brood, a.k.a. Boondock Saints. So right off the bat, you've got something that's a comical, my life is destroyed job, which is a cashier at a grocery store. Like one of the band members has that job. It's like a punchline, you know, like in a, in a, in a, in a movie, you know, like uh, in this movie. <laughs> well, no, I'm saying, but like, it's almost, it's like a, it's like the kind of job that's, it's a, the joke. Go right. It's like go, going back to your normal schlubby life after yeah. your brush with this, fame. This, yeah. this guy's a caterer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but that's specific jobs I'm saying. Anyway, yeah. Caterer so, too. Yeah. Caterer is very that too. And then this guy's just drinking. He's part of the management team. I love this actually. He's the director. Like, right. And he's just like, like, hey man, what are you, do- what, what are you doing lately? Drinking. <laughs> but then my favorite, this is the brother of Troy Duffy. And he's, uh, you know, somebody's got to paint that uh, closet, man. That's so depressing. It's unbelievable. You know, that's what yeah. I was going to say is that that, you know, as as fun it is to punch down on it a little bit, it is really, really sad and really dark, you know, in terms of it just is, like, you know. I agree. It, it, it ends with Why, a bummer. I like those guys. I love like, those guys. I have some... I have some empathy for those guys. I mean, Troy is a, a human monster, yeah. But it's just, but it's also kind of funny, <laughs> you know. It's a better life than uh, hanging out at Sloan's, like with Troy Duffy, like uh, got having you in a cult leader chokehold. I guess, is yeah. It, you know? Is it taking your lunch? Bit less is it than... taking your twenty minute lunch break in in the break room at uh, uh, Albertsons? Well, you know, it's honestly work. You know? <laughs> I, I just see what you're saying. It, it's kind of a it's a twist that they ended up, or not a twist, but it just yeah, they end up. Going back to being normal. Isn't Anvil like, like that, fame, Evan? Fame. Yeah. yeah. Anvil I mean, is the same thing. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, but but Anvil is like, you know, they they had cult success and they're respected among, you know, the, 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 the broader metal, yeah. cult metal they, scene. They could you know? scare up a Eurofest once in a while or something. That's true. <laughs> totally. The, Let's, these guys. Yeah, please. 
we got to get off the brood. We love you, brood. Uh, we got to get back. Brood. Dairy, dairy down. Down. We're dairy down with the brood. Now we're going to get on to uh, just back to the movie and, and the main A story of the film. Um, and let's just talk the about this. Yeah, let, let's talk about this. So we talked about it at the top of the show. Harvey's intention, if he was going to make the movie, if he wasn't going to make the movie. But one of the main narrative thrusts in this doc is this idea of we can't get Harvey on the phone. We're trying everything to get this movie made and to get the attention of actors. He's starting to um, ghost Duffy. Right. Harvey's ghosting him. And he's not. He's like full attention, like courting him. And then just like, he's not in. He's not in. I'll tell him you called. Right. You know. Okay, we got to contrast that though, because right before then, he's having everybody in the world kissing his ass. Like John Goodman's at his house. Marky Mark is like Jeff Goldblum. Marky Mark has this amazing quote where he's like, he's on camera going, "Man, your script is fucking amazing, man." And then he turns around to the camera and looks at the documentary camera and goes like, "Hey, his movies, his script's so good. You should film me." I don't know. Should film me. By the way, that's another Southie guy. It's more Boston shit. Yeah, it's a very Boston bro kind of thing. I but that's yeah. the that is that era so much, you know. Like we should blow them, you know. So that just gross. Totally. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so so right, so so that was happening. Everyone was in love with the script. Now he's being ghosted, and nothing's happening. But it's not affecting, you know, his ego and his narcissism. And there's an amazing he's pushing back with. Um, hostility and uh and uh frustration yeah yeah and and there's an amazing taking it on everybody. yeah there's an amazing moment here which i just want to bring up about talking about the casting options for boondock saints and he gets very frustrated and and, and you get to hear kind of, you know yeah. well he had his pick for, he had his let's just say he had his pick at yeah. the peak like mark Wahlberg, who was a huge star you know still is and like so now he's he's taking the ride down in the casting options People were turning his phone call and he's down like another he's down on the B list now. And maybe he's you know, maybe the B list isn't even right, you know. The, the, yeah, well here. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I hate Keanu Reeves, I think he's a fucking punk. I will never do a movie with him. I think Ethan Hawk is a talentless fool. I love Brenna. I don't know how long I'm willing to wait for Brenna. Oh, Brenna. Mr. Brenna, this is Mr. Duffy in Los Angeles giving you a call. I just called the I hate message machines. Bye bye. <laughs> Cunt. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Calling Kenneth. Just another day at the office for Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> that wow. would mean something different over there, though, right? Cunt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, over where? Yeah. So, um, I didn't say it to him. So, uh, yeah. I mean, um, and then he well, and well, let's just cut to the chase. So, Boondock Saints, as many know, it did get made. By like a nothing sort of probably like money laundering thing. <laughs> no, 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 no legality, please, on that one. But no, some small, small company. And so what they had to work with is uh, Billy Connolly, you know, was probably Brana, you know, and it went down there. And uh, and then nobody's actually, you know, what's really weird. So total side note is somebody got their th- shit right in the casting when it was nobody's the final cast of Boondock Saints. And they get they got somebody who's going to be a huge star like two decades later, uh, Norman Reedus from Walking yeah. Dead. Yeah. You know? Well, so Willem Defoe's there. in it briefly, right? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Will, He's the Willem Defoe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Willem's in it a little bit, yeah. Yeah. But it's mostly driven by, like, nobody's, you know. Billy Connolly, that's, there's a great moment where, like, Billy Connolly's like, oh, it's so good, you got the movie going, you got it all together, I'm so happy, you know? Like, he's giving the compliment, and then, like, uh, to his face, Duffy's like, He's like, it's like, or Connor's like, good job, man. And then uh, Duffy goes, like, the line, line of ass kisses get longer, longer every day. Every day. Like, 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 he's getting it's a compliment so, from Billy Connor. Marcus, you nailed it. That is right out of um, Eastbound and Down. Like, like everybody fucking wants a piece of my shit, man. Like, it's like, you know, like he got a little, he got like one compliment, you know, and he just blows it into insane proportions. What well, a character. That's well, a great that, call, dude. <clears throat> well, hang on. I got a great little segue into that. I right. mean, we are clip crazy here, but I think this film really demands it. Um, and uh, again, people offering compliments, and he can't handle it. I mean, first off, he can't handle criticism throughout the whole film. That's what really triggers him. But then, even when people try to compliment him, he's just sour grapes uh, here. So let's just see. Oh, right. My my favorite scene in the film is actually well, at the end. Yeah, yeah. I will. <clears throat> my 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 favorite scene is at the end. So after Boone Not Sakes has been made, after he's been through the whole rigmarole. He gets invited to speak at Ray Carney's class, which is also LOL to me, but uh, at Ray Carney's class at Boston University. 
and uh, you just have film students asking him questions, and you know, because they want to like, be him. Like an afternoon with independent filmmaker Troy Duffy, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's being taken seriously. It's incredible. And and he, and his attitude is so wild in this, but also at the very end of this clip is my favorite moment in the entire fucking movie when he singles out some poor schmuck in the audience Same. of the Same. of the. Uh, I of need the this whole movie. event. I need. I need to watch the whole event if, if, <coughs> on video. I need to see all of this. I want to. So I want to get this NFT. Okay, here we go. And I think it's curious that you would not try again. Like you get almost to that point, and you don't succeed with this one. You said. You don't want to do it ever again. You know what that feels like after you have broken your fucking ass wide open a thousand times and told to fuck off, gotten your heart pulled out and shoved down your throat? I'm kind of paying a compliment without, I'm just saying, well, I think well, that I guess I'm an asshole. I'm saying maybe you should be a little more proud of what you, I don't, I just, even if I'm it doesn't proud, come I'm out, this is, See, this is like, what, what we're talking about now, this is a conversation I've been having, I have with my sister. Oh. Uh, being a film student, you get like a lot of people in here. They're really yeah. optimistic and they're all like, She's great. Uh, I don't know, you gotta keep going. And keep, first film doesn't work, you just keep going, do whatever. You seem to be on a completely different boat. It's like your own mama slapping you a hundred times and then saying, I'm sorry, and doing it again. Weird cut. You may not agree with it. In fact, I can tell that you're not gonna. You in particular. Is right out of Eastbound and Down, like the the reaction yeah. shot, because Eastbound would have a non-professional, like just have a, a, a non-verbal reaction yeah. to like, uh, uh, you know, um, you know uh, what's his name? But uh, that's, can that's I just become like a trope too? I think that's entered the pop club. I've seen that like in The Office or like other movies, yeah, you know, big movies where they single out someone in the audience and it's awkward. Yes, is this it the is first so like cringe, <laughs> cringe comedy? You know, this it might be. Like, can I just say just a nice detail? I feel like it's like eight thirty in the morning. And like everyone's kind of just rousing and wants to talk about film, and there's this like sociopathic asshole like ranting and cursing in front of them. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah. like uh, okay, who, like who all right, made we get a movie? It. Like, who made a movie and did what they want to be doing? He did. And, made a bad movie, and buddy. I, I love that he's he's still wearing the Boondock Saints hat that says Miramax in the back <laughs> like, to the very end. You know, he didn't get yeah, a new right one with like. Well, one I didn't thing see I, that. That's great. What, 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 one thing I want to say is that just for me, you know, uh, it is depressing that the actual end of this saga is that the Boondock Saints not only was made, but the fact that it mm -hmm. actually did go on to achieve some sort of cult status among. Oh, it definitely you know, is a big cult. There was a sequel and a new and a third sequel. A second. Oh, yeah, it made money, but yeah. not for him. You know, I mean, like it, it yeah. made like fifty million dollars or something in in video sales. Like, yeah, yeah. It's a big it, hit. I looked it up. They said it bombed at the theater, right? It made like they ran it just for like you know a week at the Vine yeah. Theater, which is like I think the Lazerium Theater, right, right next to Sandy Burger and Hollywood. It is on Hollywood now. Boulevard. It's one of those theaters <laughs> where, um, actually, that's the theater where they played that um, that Muhammad Muslim video uh, that mocked him that. Um, that that caused Benghazi to happen. <laughs> anyway, but like oh, it's a place where it, it's a place. Whatever. <laughs> it's Wikipedia. Where go to die, right? Like they, they'll, they'll they'll rent it out. No, just not, no like not not die, but just like like there's like a obligation or something. Yeah, con contractual that they had. Yeah, like, you know, like a um, amount of days, and so. it's 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 dirt cheap. You know, like it's where like Michael Masden films in the last ten years <laughs> play. You know? at, at I'm not even making that up. Afternoon, right? Yeah. This yeah. is very it made that's like thirty man. grand there, and then like, yeah. but on the video it made like fifty million or something. But then yeah, yeah it took off a great poetic justice. Hey, people that, like it. That fucking that the William Morris agency who was representing him hooked him up with this contract to make sure that he didn't get anything off of like any direct to, any home video sales. They're like, you is that make true? A movie. Yes, yes, it <clears throat> says it in the movie too. That William Morris, who's been like kind of this like shadow player in the whole movie. Yeah. Like and they and the and the William Morris rap guy is super cringe. Like he like reminds me of a guy that like Corey Feldman would tell stories about or something. You know, God, Corey totally. Feldman's gonna really you know I don't know. So it, he's a super cringe guy, and uh, he's this kind of shadow player in the background. 
And uh, yeah, they, it says at the end because he says like uh, there's a, there's a great point where they're like uh, the filmmakers are asking the William Morris guy questions in an interview, and they're like, "Is this true? You know, there's there's plots all around you." He's like, "Yes." <laughs> Yeah. Oh, is it yeah. true? Is it, is, kind of is it all about money and sex? And he's like, yeah, yeah. No, it's just money. Not yeah. sex. Yeah. Just, just money. money. Yeah. Well, yeah, so yeah, they are con. A, there's a little they're line con. where he's like, um, it says in the movie that, that the William Morris agency is the one that that negotiated the contract with the you know production company and distributor to make sure that Duffy didn't make any money off of the proceeds. And then they were the implication in the film is that you know that Weinstein, since he was like had, it was kind of basically running uh, William Morris yeah. with all the shit that he was uh, pushing through there. Yeah. That he was just like, and you know, kill this guy, <laughs> make sure this guy gets uh, zero yeah. out of bone, bone this guy because he worked so closely with William Morris. So we got all his talent. <laughs> oh my oh. god! And there's a there's like they tried to someone tried to kill him at the end of the movie. Well, hang on, hang on, that. hang on. I okay. want to get to that. Save that. Put a pin in please. that for please. Put a pin. I, in I don't that believe that. I don't believe I'm, that. No, we're talking about that in a minute. I want to just close the loop on Harv here just for a sec because, um, you know, in the film, we don't we have a clip, but I think we, should, we can just talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> one of the more well-known, if there is a well-known scene from this movie, is when he finally gets Harv on the phone and he's talking to Harvey. He finally gets there and it's an amazing moment because he is trying to kind of be on the level with him. You know, he's trying to like... He's trying to father figure. Or he's, he's looking at it almost as like a father figure and being like, "I'm just a boy from, you know, a Boston bar, and you took me out and showed me the way, you know, and all this kind of stuff." I never went to film school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it, it's an amazing m- moment in the movie because you can just imagine on the other end of that phone, like you were saying at the top of the hour, that Harvey's been reading this guy this whole process, and that's the very moment that he was like, "I'm fucking done." You know, like that's it. Yeah. You know, like just listen. Well, it's like you no, know, you know, it's like it's like oh, I've this guy reminds me of so and so and so and so. Like you know what I mean? Right. Like oh, you're one of those guys. Like uh, click. Yeah. Well, he well that's the thing. Just set. Well, we're not gonna watch the clip, but like it's not even that he got him on the phone. It's that um he finally briefly gets him on the phone. Just to, you know, Harvey's tolerating him briefly before he cuts him loose completely. But he had been ghosting. It's like it's like this bear hugs from Harvey. Like, let's do lunch and then ghost. And then he gets one last call, probably just through the persistence. And probably Harvey just had him the phone, you know, like the, uh, like, he wasn't even listening. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. you know, like he was, yeah, he was, it was, it was on the phone sort of with Harvey. But yeah, and it's, uh, well, you know, okay. Um, oh, it's so cringe. Yeah. But I, again, I don't care because this is a bad person who's being hurt by Harvey. I don't care. Harvey's a monster. They're both monsters. Yeah, actually. yeah. So, fuck them yeah. both. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, what now? Definitely. Now, fl- flipping back to what you were saying about this kind of crazy en- ending piece here, where the uh, film kind of has this really scare jump scare, where there's some uh, there, there uh, Troy and CB. We didn't talk about CB, the producing partner, who also seems like yeah. he was a dark and disturbing alcoholic as well. But anyway, there's a whole chapter devoted to just kind of making cb look bad the, the film's like okay you know what we got to put in two minutes to make cb look bad so they definitely had yeah, i was trying to understand that him because he kind of comes yeah. out of nowhere they mentioned him at the beginning mm-hmm. and then he pops up at the end just being an asshole womanizer you know totally intoxicated uh, I, I was like who is this guy you know like i was kind of lost i looked him up and apparently he died in like 2013 or something like it was oh, only wow. like 43 or something so Damn. it's pretty Damn. sad but uh yeah they definitely the filmmakers definitely took the opportunity to like yeah run cb to the muck. weird bad blood between those two guys but but, but no so so the setup is this is one of the few screenings festival screening palm springs springs film festival uh boondock saint screening and outside yes yeah, sorry yeah sorry yeah uh, outside there is a car that allegedly swerved into them and then drove off. And then the film has these kind of ending title cards that says, you know, that uh, basically Troy believed that there are people out to get him. And then he, he armed himself with a gun. And my, my whole thing about that is I'm totally with you. I don't think that there was anything, you know, he's not important enough for something like that. People like no. him who are as narcissistic uh, as, as he was in this period of time. I don't know if he still is, but in that period of time. Um, you know, you, you sort of invent these things to give yourself an importance that you don't really have. And I think also 
yeah and 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 also just like you know it's it, it's it's i don't know it's it's something that would totally happen to that personality to take all of that negative and then turn into paranoia is exactly what would happen oh of course you know, you know? it's all a negative vortex every uh, emotion is just like putrid you know and uh and and the way he's interacting with the world uh, paranoia is going to start creeping in but i also don't believe him when he exhibits paranoia and says i got a gun because it's drama people are talking yeah. about um me me, you know, me it's just yeah They're it's scared yeah, of right. me attention yeah. yeah exactly it's a classic thing actually boy this is my one major geek moment but like it reminded me of the end of demon lover diary oh, uh look that up if you cut. haven't seen it or yeah it is a deep cut but anyway and i'll move very quickly through it but the film strangely ends where this documentary couple are filming um the making of this horrible mid-70s horror film called demon lover and uh, they get into such a pro problem with the filmmakers in Detroit, Michigan, that um, evidently they, they pulled guns on them and they had to run. The documentarians had to run for their lives, you know, and there's gunshots. And the documentarians or the sorry, excuse me, the filmmakers of the bad horror film always say they just added gunshots and totally fabricated. It and they just ran to their car and they filmed that and they made it seem like we were crazy rednecks shooting at them, in, you know, these Detroit filmmakers. So. Anyway, that's what immediately came to mind with me because, you know, there's things like it, it's, it's out of context. There's no, there was no other context that moment. It was just this like, you know, swerving thing and like, like, uh, it did nothing like that happened again. It just, it felt artificial and, uh, and, uh, contrived. Thanks for, you know? thanks for a good movie though. And I think that's the, that's the sort of, that's, that's the documentarian choice. Yes. Like, I think well, maybe that's the same legend, in both cases. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. some Nanook in the, of the North type of shit. <laughs> right. You know? Can I, can I, can I, based on like dovetailing off of that, can I ask you guys just individually, do you think Overnight, the film, is a good documentary? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Mm. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, they had, they had, you could tell they had no money. They had like barely prosumer cameras, you know, you know what I mean? It was very, uh, they were just there. So what, what do you, what do you do when you just have a bunch of like cheapo footage? where you can exhibit your talent is through the editing. And it's pretty good. You know, like I like the little touches, like there's this long, horrible argument with the band and they run uh, Duffy doing like uh, yeah. lead, lead guitar runs through the whole argument. Yeah, that was great. a really nice touch. So they, there's there's some nice little touches there. It's not an incredible film or documentary, but yeah. the subject matters, that's what's compelling. You know? I like but they did a good job. Of it. it could, I feel like it could look a little bit better. There's like some 16 in it, some Super 8. There's like the titles are all kind of crunchy. You know, oh, like, I know. It's hard it's to so, read. It's a, the it's fonts ugly. are terrible. It's, movie. it's, it's not yeah. pretty to watch. No. It doesn't sound that great. It's, you know... But it's still so good. I mean, like the the character the character of Duffy is so compelling, so interesting. You like can't take your eyes off this movie. I was like stayed up too late. It was so exhausted the next day. I rewatching it again. You know, I couldn't stop. And um, I think that's what. Yeah. So I do think it's a great documentary because of that. I mean, like it was right. Pl it's a right place, right time. You're the fucking documentary camera person. You're not shooting the wrong thing. They were like, I like somehow they knew what to shoot. Yeah. Like, you're right. Like, you know, like there's parts where they continue on. They show like the the continuation of the shot. Like, they, okay, so like with Skunk Baxter, they shoot Troy. Like he says something like, "Hey, maybe you should not do that with the cords." And then Duffy's like says like, "Hey, man, I'm talking to my brother." Then they go off him back to Skunk, who like just kind of looks down, and then they cut back. Oh and yeah, they just stand down to him tapping his pen, kind of like skunk just tapping his pen and the, the, the filmmaking was good the the the, uh, the camera work was good they did this it's true they got all the the pieces that you needed to tell that story so i do think that they shot well and the editing is great too because you don't think about how when you're watching it the first time you don't think about god they just cut this guy's dialogue to, to shit it's like you know i didn't think about it being a hit piece the first time i watched it but right Rewatching it, you just see how many times they they cut, 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 yeah. cut, 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 cut. Yeah. So they like, I do think it's 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 interesting. Uh, that's partly you know a weird thing about the documentary, but it, but it makes it so good. I think you're right. Like, um, yeah, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's well made. I, we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to ask yeah. my one final question. Mm -hmm. uh, start with you know Marcus, I guess. Um, was there anything that you respect about uh, Troy Duffy hmm. or like? I was a little jealous that he got to hang out with Patrick Swayze. <laughs> Good answer. But that's not an attribution to his <laughs> no, character. Bad that's true. 
just in the presence that's of. Well, that's the best thing I could say about it. Well, I think actually, you know what? Actually, he got the movie made. You know, he yeah. did get the movie made. So You're right. At and the it end was directed. Of the day, I gotta kind of respect that. He got the movie made, you know, and it made money. It did well. So well, right. he made he he made the damn movie. It didn't end with him like, you know, like with it unmade. Okay, that's fair. Mine uh, is uh, yeah. My, mine is is tough. It's it's hard just given the evidence of or just looking at his depiction in Overnight. It's hard to find anything likable there from what we're seeing in Overnight. So what I will say is I m- my heart broke for his brother. You know Troy Troy I don't yeah. know, uh, Taylor Duffy. Uh, my yes. heart broke for him in the film, especially, you know, we were talking about why did nobody stand up to him? Actually, his brother is the only person that stood up to him in that one scene. And it actually became real dark yeah. at that point. But what I will yeah. say is my sort of fan fiction. This is a fan fiction thing that I respect, which I don't know is even true. But looking into sure. the credits, looking into the credits of Boondock Saints 2. OK, <laughs> this is how deep I went. I noticed that the story credit, the story by credit is Troy and Taylor Duffy. So I'd like to think that they really came oh, together. Oh, Boondock Saints? Boondock Saints 2. Yeah. So I oh. I would sort of like right, to think that they patched things up. Reconciled. And, uh, yeah. They reconciled and... and, and oh, okay. They That's could. interesting. You broke them hey, off. They're huh? brothers. They're brothers. Brothers go through weird shit. You know, I can't answer my own question. I guess I'll just speak to what Marcus said is just, um, just, just generic uh, ambition and gener- being driven just on a generic level. I guess that's better than not being driven and just eating Taco Bell all day and watching uh, Mori Povich. Like, okay, like, <laughs> very, like, very Taco commit, Bell crew, people, too, you're looking at here. No, I, no I'm um, just saying, like, more people, more people do that than what he did. And I don't know if I respect it. I don't know if I like it, but that is dis- that distinguishes him. He was very driven, and he really did make uh, at least boondocks happen. I mean, that's, that's not nothing. But that's he's it, about to make boondock three happen. No, that's it's what's scary to me. The drive is scary to me a little bit. And, you know, Boondock Saints 3, yes, is now going to be in production. Uh, last thing it's I just incredible. wanted to get out. Like, uh, what, what, yeah, Hitler I, had drive, oh, right? <laughs> what last thing I wanted to say here before we get out here is, um, man, Boondock Saints uh, is my least favorite aesthetic of any film ever. Um, you know, f- flavor saver facial hair with desert eagles, you know, and sideburns and double wielding pistols. Um, as we were calling it, uh, earlier, uh, very, very Quentin Totino's, we were calling it. Um, here's some other, uh, right. Jinko Noir, I was calling it, uh, Pub Fiction, um, Ooh, and, Ma- nice. and Matrix Really Loaded. Okay. All right, guys. Hey, uh, <laughs> all right, guys. Well, that was one fucking hour. Uh, on that was fun. Overnight. That was fun. Yeah. Highly recommended, guys. Seek it out. Oh, you can see it. Should we give the plug? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If, if you want to see the film, I highly encourage you to watch it on Tubi because it's streaming for free there. Uh, so get it on Tubi. I'll actually put the link in the description get, if you want to watch it. Get and watch your it overalls. Free get your overalls on. Yeah, get, get, your get a bottle of Jägermeister. And some sick hey, grab an acoustic guitar and do some sick uh, scales, dude. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Scales. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> as is the soft Whoa. focus. Whoa. All right. Oh. Um, well, that was uh, right. one fucking hour. Right, our podcast on... is disintegrating. It is. That was a lot of fun. And Wait. really, over uh, overnight, aka overalls, it, it's highly recommended. It's 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 entertaining and it's insightful about Hollywood and uh, and sociopaths. That is right. And so next week we'll be back um, uh, with another fucking hour, and we're going to take a hard turn into a different direction here, which I'm very excited about because it's one of my favorite movies of all time. I know. I think it's one of yours too, right, Tom? I think it's one of yours. Yeah, favorites. absolutely. We're going to be going into looking yeah. at Superfly from 1972, uh, which I'm so excited. Obviously, iconic Curtis Mayfield score, uh, Gordon Parks Jr. directed. Uh, just one of the coolest movies of all time. Um, I, I, Ron O'Neill. Ron O'Neill. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's. I hate. I'm so done with like the word black exploitation, but for lack of a term, it's my favorite black exploitation film. Um, how about it's just one of my favorite seventies films, you know, My uh, yeah, like probably. gritty. Yeah. And, and like, like just gritty New York city. It's a great New York city movie, you know? And, uh, and, and it's just a blast. Yeah. So I was just going to say the music, yeah. but, but everything, you know, the credit sequence, like, like they knew like, man, our titles got to float in, you know, <laughs> like the way it's, the title floats in. We'll get into it. Yes, of yes, course.
yeah, and so we will. Uh, so everybody, get your pre-watch in for uh, Superfly. I'm sure you can find that everywhere. And we will see you back here next week. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. And now uh, for your moment of zen. And uh, we'll catch you next time. See you later. Down, down, dearie, dearie, down, dearie, dearie, down. Ah, down, down, dearie, dearie, down, dearie, dearie, down. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs>